Suki, I'm sure many of our viewers can probably pick up the audio that's coming around in our studio. The storm has arrived. Category four Typhoon Mawar may no longer be a super typhoon, but it is still a major cause for concern for everyone here in the territory. The storm making landfall late this afternoon. The eye of the storm predicted to hit the southern region, but it nudged it further north. We really started to see some of the worst conditions as early as three o'clock this afternoon. Shutters even being ripped off right off the building. Let's take a look at video captured this afternoon just outside our Harmon Studios. One year after Typhoon Mawar battered Guam in the Marianas, half a day, I'm Nick Delgado. Welcome to a special anniversary of Typhoon Mawar hitting our island here, mightier than Mawar. It's all in the name, half a day to the KWM News team here as well for joining us and sharing your experience. It's been a long time since we were hit this hard and for some of you, never experienced it before in a day in your life. What do you recall preparations were like for you? We'll start with you, Vic. Um, for me, you know, being here at KYM for all these years, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, storms come through, a lot of storm watches, I participated in a lot of that. So this one was kind of uh, different because we knew that it was going to be um, something that's going to hit us hard. So the preparation was a little more uh, uh, crazier where you kind of stock up at home and, and preparing everything while you set up that and then come to work. So it was, it was, it was a little different from the other ones. Well, I guess as the uh, elder statesman now on our team, um, it, it was procedure for me because I've covered enough of these over the years. Um, and like Joan and I have done a bunch together. And so I was basically camped out at civil defense and Homeland Security for like the three days leading up to it, doing live streams every day, yeah. getting updates from the NWS. And, and yeah, like Vic said, I mean, they were anticipating, I think the, the specific line that NWS gave us was they were like, we're projecting this being a long day uh, with significant destruction. Well, like Jay said, you know, we've experienced many uh, typhoons and this was actually the first one where I, you know, waited out here at the station. So there was no one at our house, so, but we secured it before heading out to our respective jobs. So that was the part that was kind of, you know, scary. But yeah, sat here through what, 48 hours of the typhoon, mm -hmm. so. Well, for personally for me, I felt like I was on the flip side to this because this was my first typhoon that I experienced as an as an adult where I can remember what actually happened. But I definitely was not pre prepared for it. I remember Destiny was telling us she had like this uncanny feeling where I feel like once we come back from this, everything is going to be changed. And I didn't believe her until it happened and everything was different. Yeah. Yeah. And similar experience with Suki, um, as an adult, this is my first time really experiencing a typhoon of this magnitude. And something that really sticks out to me is uh, before the storm hit, we went out as a team to go and see how people were preparing, getting water, gassing up their cars. So did the same thing. And it was, it was definitely an experience and a lesson learned, definitely at that. That we don't want to do again. Definitely not. But I'll, I'll, we all covered the stories that happened in the days leading up to the storm making landfall and in the aftermath. And we have one of those stories to share with you right now. Definitely one of those things that we do not want to forget is that people were touched differently by Typhoon Mauer. And one of those, uh, two of those residents that we have to, we cannot forget is uh, Julie, Gogui, and Doris. And we check in with them a year after Typhoon Mauer. I don't know what else to do. Like, I can't tell her that we're gonna be okay. This was Dededo resident Julie Gogui in the aftermath of Typhoon Mawar last May, taking in the damage of the storm's wrath on the home she shares with her mother Doris. The strong winds ripping the roof off their house while rain flooded inside, leaving behind a devastating image of the haven her late father built before his passing. Mawar rendering the place unlivable. It's just hard. It's like, she's ever wondering who's going to rebuild her house because her husband I'm like, I don't know, we'll try. Now, a year later, Julie and her mother Doris sit in front of the pink and blue painted walls of their renovated home. Julie's younger brother and his co-workers did the rebuilding. But the journey to getting their home back together was a struggle. After not qualifying for some post mower services, like the Rise Up Temporary Roofing Project. I mean, I thought the point is to fix the roof. I mean, if you're... If I'm not all damaged up there, then they'll help. But if it's totally damaged, they can't help. I don't understand that. Their property even turning into an illegal dumping area after the storm. When we clear it, they dump again. The cars, we clear the cars, they come take it. 
then they put cars again. And yet, amid so much hardship, the duo's resilience is still unwavering. They leave this message with others on the anniversary of Mawar. For those people out there that are still, you know, struggling, I'm still struggling, I'm still up to now. People that are still struggling out there, just have faith and just keep moving on, just do what you can do. You know, I just always say just have hope. And there's a will, yeah. there's a way. Days after Mawar, the community came together, cleaning up for each other. The effort took us to the place Delma Kaiko and her family called home. Five houses and seven family on the ranch. It was so hard in the beginning mm -hmm. when we were cleaning. It was really hard for us mm -hmm. to like rebuild it, to start all over. It's so hard because when we came here, there was no houses, like just one. So. If, we have to start again to buy stuffs to rebuild the house. Volunteers showing up was just a start. We were able to clear their entire area in one day and then in the, the following day when we went back to get the trash, we were able to take out the majority of the trash too. So it was just like a really great showing for the community. Now, one year later, structures now stand with roofs over their growing families' heads. Cameron Roosevelt showed us where they are in their recovery. Uh, that one is the one that uh, Delma did, and this one is the one that my sister lost Ali did. Talk about, you know, was it, was it, was it really like, uh, months after? Did it take a while to, to get funds? To yeah, it did, uh, it did take a while after because uh, uh, that group, uh, group Nihi, the, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Uh, that group Nihi helped them out uh, with some uh, donations and with the help, and also uh, their claims with FEMA. Still, getting back to the way things were before the storm is an ongoing process. It's been uh, progressing. So uh, after, uh, after like losing everything, and then getting back like little by little, uh, they're, uh, they're actually back on their feet now. And then and is it, are you guys at 100% or are you guys still? Not really 100% as you guys can see, this ranch is still uh, growing. Uh, they're still trying to build more into like, it's not quite finished. They're still uh, doing little by little what they can. Uh, they're, they're actually building it themselves. So, uh, when they have time, uh, besides their uh, usual jobs, they actually put, uh, put more on. Wow, a lot went down on the night of the storm, especially right here. Can you believe that this is where all of the water was coming down? It was like a waterfall, exactly where we are right here. I mean, no tickets to come, going to the pool at this one, right? No fares needed. It was a flood. Blood zone. Is that something you're familiar with working here as well, Jace? Well, year? okay. Well, the kind of like the inside story that nobody out there knows is I was actually going around to like everybody here, and especially those of you that this was your first storm. And I emphatically told you guys, guys, if you want to ride it out here, there's no place safer than to take care of, you know, take care of yourself and your family. Then at KUM, we've got good internet, we've got generators, we've got aircon. I came in the next day because it's just me and my mom, and this is the first storm, unlike Joan, that uh, I actually went home. Uh, to take care of. I came in like the next day and I could not believe just how much damage there was and I saw you guys like get up the next day. It was crazy. For me, I remember, well aside from like the flooding and all the water coming down, um, for me it was hearing the tin outside just like scraping against the, sh the parking lot mm -hmm. and also with, like the parts where the shutters weren't really covering. You could hear like the, the wind going through so it's like a howling and it was almost like not knowing what is going on outside and all you could do is just like sit and hear and like wait it out and um but i'm so glad that i was here with you know with team kum too because i can't imagine me at home alone 
and going through all that and experiencing all that. We were literally holding down the fort, but I think (laughs) those words that you provided for us, Chase, did provide some comfort because we did have that confidence that things were going to hold together, even though when Mitsuki and I were anchoring that night, you could hear the entire newscast just the rumble and the storm was here. And there's a word together, at least everybody, everybody here, you guys all had each other. Right, yeah, I definitely remember. I was um, sleeping right here where we are actually on this couch, (laughs) trying to take a nap with all the sounds around us. But I remember like water was falling down from our ceilings. It was coming down the walls and we were getting worried about the equipment. Thankfully, most of the equipment was fine. But I remember um, something even fall on top of our cameraman Daniel's um, head, but thankfully he was not injured. But it was just a, a scary experience overall. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I was at home, thankfully, uh, during the storm. And it's something uh, I resonate with with Joan about not knowing what was going on outside. But, you know, I'm a very uh, audio learner, I guess. I'm an audio individual. So hearing all of that going on outside was so terrifying, in all honesty. Uh, My dogs actually went into the closet because they were so fearful of what Mm -hmm. was going on outside. So that was one thing that really stood out to me, definitely. And then that story we just saw with you, Victorious, when you had to revisit Zero Down, incredible, incredible what we just saw the images coming out of there in the aftermath and great to see how they were recovered, but the recovery isn't done yet. No, not yet. And like we heard from, you know, we wanted to talk to that, uh, the individual that we talked to when we went there, but obviously she was off island with the dad and we're doing an um, appointment in Hawaii, but just talking to the cousin and just seeing, um, her, her telling us the, the process that they had to go through, you know, they had SBA here, they had FEMA, and the, the process that they, they had to go through to get those loans and get those those fundings to help them and just to see them, um, you know, uh, change up and just rebuild from the, the bottom up. And it was just so amazing to see how, how it changed from, from day one after until today. Mawar did not uh, did not hold back from, from hitting whoever it could when it came through our region. But like the title of this show, we are mightier than Mawar and we will continue with more Looking back one year later, keep it here. Instead of a, a long day of action, it was more of a, a late day and the overnight period of action. And it was that long duration. This was a slow moving typhoon as it clipped over the northern parts of Guam. And so we were very fortunate that morning that people that were not in shelter early Wednesday morning, they had that little bit of window to get to shelters at the last minute. But then things rapidly deteriorated Wednesday afternoon and more so into the overnight hours. Jay Smallwar really took down a lot of our our service capabilities here in the island. All of our networks were trying to get a hold of us. People wanted content. They wanted updates. They couldn't know how to reach us. And we didn't even know if people were watching the news that we were putting together and gathering during and after. But... We did it anyway. Yeah, and uh, telecommunications were so, so essential. And, you know, we were, like you said, we were still doing our job. And we're like, we're going to put this out there. Somebody's going to see it. Everybody's going to share it. Um, but I was literally the next day driving around all over here. I went up to the uh, the Dedito Sports Complex, going around um, the parking lot, finding essentially a sweet spot where I could upload that's night, that night's news that we were putting all putting together, basically editing the whole thing in the back of my car. You know, Daniel and I were doing it with the trunk open, um, just getting stuff out there because everybody wanted to know. And whether you were watching on your phone, on your iPad, if you had, you know, 3% battery left on your on your mobile device, you know, we were trying to get the word out and we're trying to find a signal wherever we could. Yeah, it was definitely very important to share the stories of how our community was um, facing the aftermath of the typhoon. And one place that we visited was St. Dominic Senior Care Home. And we learned about the heroics that happened that night and now their road to recovery. In the height of Typhoon Mawar, these heroes without capes hunkered down at the St. Dominic Senior Care Home in Barangada. It's 17 staff members that shelter here with me. We were here for three days straight. Um, no one left, um, just caring for our elders. As Acting Administrator Kate Keesling told us last May, nurses and staff protected the elderly residents as shutters ripped off and windows blew open. I have one staff member who literally blocked her body, used her body to block debris. After a window flew open at one of our patients, um, we're just incredibly lucky no one is hurt or, or passed. Um, we're very lucky to all be alive right now. A year later, they're still on the road to recovery, but a lot has changed. We've had a lot of um, amazing progress in the last year. I mean, last time you guys were here post-Typhoon Mawar, we had, you know, ceilings coming down, lights that were out, exposed electrical, um, 
furniture that was completely soaked and damaged. They're on demand with donations from the community. The heartbeat of St. Dominic's is really the individuals in the community that, you know, come out and give whatever they can, whenever they can. And the elderly and staff. Our Manamco are great. Um, everyone's doing well. Um, staff, you know, it's hard because they also went through incredible hardship, not only here, but then in their personal lives at home. And um, everyone's great. We had almost $40, $47,000 independently donated from Off Island, which was huge for our staff. While they still have more to do, like replacing their generator, furnitures, and doors, she thanks the community for their support. Thank you so, so much for everything. I mean, as individuals, as institutions, we're just so grateful for all the support of St. Dominic's always, and please continue to support the mission. As the winds calmed, the crowds braved going out to see the destruction Ma were left in its wake. The governor had not yet lifted Condition of Readiness 1. Many rushed to find a place that's open for business. At Onodera's store, some lined up early so they could stock up on food and supplies. Carmen Onodera knew she had to work after the storm passed. So you said they were calling you during the storm? Yeah, because, you know, like right after that wind, I'll get messages, you know, because they know me and if I had it at home, I gave it. Mm -hmm. Like eggs, you know, coconut milk, yeah. <laughs> bread. And, and even at first light, here you are operating. What's that? Here you are open yeah. and operating at first light. Yeah. Why, why did you decide I got to do this even though there's other cleaning up? To do? That's because the people, you know, we know they need it. But it's rough, man. I lived all the time. <laughs> Others were out sharing similar experiences. It was really hard. I mean, everything is a mess. Our house, our house is flooded and everything is wet. But I'm thankful that we're still around, you know? Still alive. Yes. In the 12 months that passed, the island still working to get back on its feet. We revisited Onodera's store. How has the year been? Still the same. Not, we're not fully recovered, you know. I don't, I think we are in some areas, but not all areas. Do the customers still come in and talk about how they're in, still in recovery mode? Yeah. That's tough. You clearly still do what you did that day. Yeah, we still store. do it. Yeah, we still cater to our people. Uh, they, I mean, if that's what you're asking, what do we do? We still cater to our everyday people. Yeah. There's still people that don't have roof over their heads. I mean, you see it. It's out there. You know. That's it? That's it. Oh, wow. Uh, the aftermath, the day after. I think we were still in condition of readiness one, and people were already leaving their homes, trying to pack up on supplies. We visited the owner Dara's store here in Dededo. It was one of the closest places that we could go to. The line wrapped around outside the building, if you can recall that, Suki. Yeah, definitely. And even on our drive um, there to Onodera's store, it was um, it was just devastating seeing all the homes that were um, hit hard by the typhoon and all the trees that were down. But once we got to that store, there were people lining up, as you said. They were there to get batteries, to get water, to get ice. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these stores did not have ice. That was one thing that everyone was looking for at the time. Understandably, everyone was very emotional, still shaken about what they went through. One woman I even remember sharing how the uh the wind was so strong she had to take her mattress to hold up against her window so that the she wouldn't feel the pressure from what was she was experiencing in her home but those that we spoke with at the store that day they admit that even to this day we're still recovering we had to lean forward and to make sure that all of the staff were accounted for but also ready mentally physically and emotionally to engage whatever we're dealing with because what we were doing those days were to save lives. Well, you know, one thing that we all kind of share in is the loss of power, water, but for some, they didn't have food, they didn't have a shelter, and that was really hard as a reporter to witness. Um, but thankfully, we got to interview some incredible volunteers with the Red Cross community, the Red Cross organization. So let's take a look at where they are now. They are the guiding hands that helped our island community back on its feet after one of the most impactful natural disasters in recent years, from ensuring that people had a hot meal every day. We're delivering 1,100 times two a day for all, and these are all divided to among uh, shelter. We have four shelters open. 
and also uh, distribute getting some food for our team. To making sure those who lost everything to Typhoon Mauer had a roof over their heads. Right now it's the assessments with the shelters. Now, most of the folks don't have a home to go back to. Now a year later, the impact of the collective work by these volunteers with the American Red Cross Guam chapter is still being felt. Almost everywhere we go, I've got people coming up saying, Mr. Dan, remember <laughs> me? You were up at zero day. When we have a conversation, <laughs> they always, sometimes it, you know, it comes up about Mawar. And, you know, we get so emotional and we like think, oh, how did we do that? Volunteers Dan Kogar and Margie Nicholas say their experience during Mawar has helped them to fill in the gaps in their natural disaster response. We have our own uh, communication system now, like the Starlink, which we did not have before. We have our own radio, so if that happened again, we would have communication and we could respond immediately where we could not do that after Mawar. We also have established the, um, our vendor, so we already know pretty much who to contact because during Mawar, it's just like everybody's down, so it's hard for us to, to get all this meal ordered. And, you know, you're talking about the whole island. Now they say they're ready for whatever comes next. Kogar adding post Mauer, the FEMA warehouse is stocked with the right supplies, streamlining immediate distribution to the community instead of waiting for headquarters to come to the island. From cooking out of their homes to a brick and mortar restaurant in the heart of Tumon. It's a success story Habibi's owners Nadao Ware and Sarah Langsy say is all thanks to the community. None of this briefly would have happened without the community support. It was a teamwork. Everyone participated. It, it seemed like the island was in disaster and everyone just jumped in to try to help each other. Yeah. It was last May the former catering business along with friends and volunteers were cooking up a storm after Typhoon Mawar feeding thousands from first responders to families hit the worst. He already knew what to do how he was going to help the island if it got devastated like other places. As a sailor I've spent my life in the ocean. I knew that's not going to miss us. Aware has seen his fair share of natural disasters. He knew he had to prepare for the worst. And I knew that there will not be any commercial kitchen or any place to cook. No power. I knew there will not be water. Now their dine-in restaurant has a loyal customer base who remember their actions during the community's time of need. It's and, uh, certainly the right thing it. to do. This was the right thing to do. Simple like that. Yeah. Just want to help whenever we can, wherever we can. That's his motto, and uh, definitely a beautiful motto to adopt and help others. And to this day, Habibi's making sure their cuisine fills the bellies of even those who need it most. It's tough to even recall some of the things we had to endure in the days that followed Mawar being here, right? We had to work at a satellite office. Thankfully, our friends at IT provided some place that was reliable for us to keep our internet services running. Um, everyone else just started coming together, pulling together. Who braved the gas lines? <laughs> everyone, huh? <laughs> I know. I know. Vic got some absolutely amazing footage because Vic, you, you sent your drone up, and you were getting shots from like all over the island, especially like up here with the the power plant, which was still being built. I mean, you know, it still is being built right now, but that w that was incredible. It was, and and mind you, before um, all our, I, I did a shot there. And having put the drone up after Mauer and just seeing how that the, the power plant just bent like a like a tin can, it was like it was buckled. It, yeah, it was so crazy to see how strong, and that's how you know how strong Mauer was, not only to but only to like uh, industrial places like that. So it was pretty crazy to see. Yeah, the winds were incredible, and then also the response we saw from all the federal and local agencies that was also pretty incredible to see. But there were some scary times. What got us through it though were the community coming together and really giving back as we saw in the story over uh, that we just saw with Mitsuki, the, that group. Yeah, definitely. A lot of homes did not have power and some people, in fact, didn't even have their homes after the typhoon. But this one group, um, Habibi's Catering, they were um, working alongside volunteers and friends and just people just coming together to really feed our first responders and the families that were hit the hardest. Um, a lot of people had damage, a lot of people lost some things, but many people up here lost everything they own. And so it, it's their stories that are so heartbreaking to see the photos and videos coming out of those villages and those neighborhoods. Um, this is going to uh, be something they remember for their lifetime.
uh, but we want to make sure that we think back on this as positively as possible, that this is what rallies an island together as a people, and that we can come together again when we face uh, significant weather threats. So in the aftermath of Typhoon Mawar, I remember just coming back to the station, it being pitch black, you're just having to use our cell phone lights to kind of make our way through the to throughout the station with the little battery yeah. we had. <laughs> and you know, any you know, it was like hot, and that around that time it was really, really hot. So um, it was just how you know, but we just started the recovery, you know, from there. Whether it would be just opening the doors to give us some light to just start sweeping out the water, you know, removing stuff that was damaged from the water. Um, but it was really just like all, all hands on deck kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and a couple that I had a chance to sit and get their perspective on what they did was Pat Lucis and his beautiful wife, Jenny. Um, they stay like right across the street there from our studio over in Liguan Terrace. And they actually were contacted by almost every single media outlet in the Philippines uh, for their perspective and getting the word out about how things were here and what they could do to help. As leaders in GovGuam and within the Filipino community, Pat and Jenny Lucis have made their mark locally by looking forward, not back. But the emotional tugs couldn't be avoided by the Dedido couple when they remember that long and frightening evening that Mawar passed over northern Guam. It just brings back all the, all the terror during that time and trying to keep my family safe mm -hmm. and uh, trying to get the word out and trying to make sure my family who are out there are, are safe and um, yeah, it's just Painful, painful times, but uh, I'm, I'm glad we're, we we're, we're in a happy time now. <laughs> we survived. Yeah. The morning after, and despite a loss of power and water, their ability to communicate stayed on as they were contacted by numerous media outlets out of the Philippines for their on-the-ground insight into conditions and where to go for help. Before, during, uh, and, and after Mawar, uh, we were getting calls left and right for interviews. We had over 10 different interviews and at the time they were asking us uh, how our Filipino com uh, community is doing throughout the island and so we were in touch with many of our uh, officers and our members uh, who are living in different parts of the island and we wanted to also uh, do something for, the, for uh, those who were in need, those who were, uh, lost their homes, lost their uh, clothing, uh, food and everything and so uh, we did cut some of our uh, services for, for the island of Guam. Now, as they say, the most insatiable appetite is the hunger for information. And Pat and Jenny provided updates all day long. Uh, you know, it, we had the earliest interview at, uh, I want to say, 8 o'clock in the morning, and it would be like almost uh, every, every hour, every two hours, and they won't stop until 9 o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, mm -hmm. We have radio stations calling and saying, hey, some things were... We have, we're on one interview, the other one's calling and say, hey, can we get you in? And so uh, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty hectic. We had to, <laughs> we had to take turns. Uh, hey, you get the 1.30, I'll get the, the 2 o'clock. Jenny had dabbled with social content creation before, but this new opportunity gave her the confidence and experience to develop a new voice, one she continues to use today on YouTube. For, for me to share what our experience was, like, this is what happened, this is how, it looks right now after the mower the next morning what like all the tables out the chairs are like flew away and stuff like that and what our uh, our neighbors so it's really like giving information visually pat's a longtime public servant a proud filipino and a man of faith but first and foremost he's a dad looking after his babies and jenny wasn't about clout or trending or influence or boosting her follower count it was always for the both of them about doing the right thing. So the first day actually was all we did after the Mawar was all the interviews. We didn't even clean up and everything. We cleaned up after. So it was like, okay, let's take this responsibility. They want to know what happened. Whatever information you want, let's just give it to them. And after a week of post-typhoon cleaning, interviews, and checking on their friends, the Lucis family enjoyed some normalcy, sharing a proper meal together on their porch. With Pat, of course, working the grill and camera operator Jenny chronicling the experience to tell everyone that things were finally all right. Uh, these are the most treasured, treasured memories, treasured moments. Um, just to have every, all of us together and be a family and just uh, have a meal and share stories. This is what we experienced for three weeks, no power. This is what we did. We're charging our phones in the car. We were sweating. <laughs> we're <laughs> and the long gas lines for like the long gas lines. five hours. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was scary before, but now when looking looking back, it, it was, uh, it's like we looked, look at it like we survived.
all of you are doing well and staying safe during this recovery period. Destruction, that's one word to describe what type of mob are left in its wake. You can see the destruction left here behind me, the damage, solar panels, trees, other items, all ripped off. This is where it all happens. This is where the assistance that you need. And if you want, if you have questions, you want to ask in person, it'll happen right here. The water is still out, but again, this water source is available for everybody. So this is the report for now. I'm Destiny Cruz reporting for KUAM in Manila. All right, well, this is um, Veterna Water Store in Harmon. For now, I'm Mitsuki Hariyama reporting in Dededo. But we'll, we will be sure to bring you more coverage throughout the island of how you guys are faring after Typhoon Mawar. What an incredible journey this has been with all of you. I think the plus side is it's a much cooler inside <laughs> our studios, right? You can't complain about that, but just so much devastation that we had to endure. I love seeing that island is green again um, and everyone is coming together. For me, the experience is one I do not want to go through, but a clear reminder that we should always stand ready and be prepared for anything that Mother Nature sends our way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess for me too is uh, the same, you know, sharing the same sentiment as you, Nick. You know, uh, it's really, um, you know, for, we've had so much uh, typhoons in the past, but we've always said, we've always had this mindset like, ah, oh, it's just going to pass. It's just one of those that's going to pass. But your so, dog Lambo knew better. Yes, he did. And we had him <laughs> here during the typhoon. Uh, so just seeing this one and just going through it, I, just, I guess for me, it's like preparation is always key um, when it, knock on the wood, you know, yeah. if another one has to come. So yeah, that's my, just to be prepared and be ready. Well, real quick for me is, is I was fresh out of high school in the early 90s and everything. So I went through that whole string of typhoons for that whole decade period and even, you know, afterwards. But these are things that every Guamanian has to know and will experience. We heard from Landon earlier in the show is, you know, it, this is going to happen again at some point. Um, so these are things that we have to know and be prepared for. And I think like our community is uh, so much better prepared now. I think for me, it's not to take the littlest things for granted. Like afterwards, things that like internet, where we are so we rely on it so much, and just having to make contact with family off island or even news uh, stations abroad mm -hmm. that were wanting to know what happened here, and things such as like a cold drink or ice or a hot meal or whatever. Those things were like so like they were scarce during that time for like two to three weeks, and and it just things that you. Yeah, you, you just have, when you look at it, it's like you have to kind of appreciate it a little bit more. So. I agree with that. <laughs> I've never been more grateful to have ice in my freezer than after <laughs> Typhoon Mawar. I would never complain about the cold aircon again, maybe here and there, but definitely prefer that over the heat. But yeah, next time around, like, for God forbid if we ever do have another typhoon, but knowing Guam, we probably will. But next time, I feel like I will be better prepared got to stock up on water this time gas my car do not wait in those long lines in the aftermath but yeah and i will be ready and more prepared to hunker down and weather the storm with you guys all yeah Aww. well i think one thing that really stood out to me a year after mawar was definitely the resiliency of our island people like Jace mentioned, and Suki, it's bound to happen. We're going to have a typhoon again. Um, but so many of the people that we spoke with were, you know, in the middle of so much devastation. And the resounding thing that they said is we're going to get through this. And it's just a testament to how strong we are as island people. And I am so, 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 so beyond grateful to everyone who has helped, you know, get our island back on its feet. Yeah, and we're still trying to get back up again, pick up all the pieces as much as we can. Like the title of this special, We Are Mightier Than Mawar. Thank you to our Destiny Crews, Mitsuki Hiriyama, Joe Nogan Charfris, Jason Salas, Victorious Falan, and to all of our production team, Mike, Carlito, Pete, um, Danny, Jacob, Byron, uh, Julianne, who was here as well, helping us with the coverage, and all of them out there 
who made us still shine and make sure that we got the news and information, even if we had to go out there and physically hand them where to go to get the assistance they needed with FEMA and Red Cross. It was very important and, and we did it without hesitation. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for the effort that you put into it and the time you took away from your loved ones and your family members as well. And I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. And thank you everyone else for joining us for this one year special. We'll end on that note. Yeah. Until next time, catch you on primetime. Thanks for watching.